that's okay uh, so that we can save this in our shot of the scientist's archive so um since i've forgotten to record i'm going to say it one more time i'm i'm raja i'm a faculty member at uc santa cruz i love studying andromeda and triangulum and it's resolved populations margaret i'll have you do another introduction please Sure, so I'm Margaret Lazzarini. Um, I'm an astronomer, a postdoc uh, working at Caltech. Hey, Sarah. You guys wanna introduce yourselves one more time so that we have it on the recording? Hello, I'm Liv. I'm a second year PhD student from Tufts University in Boston. Uh, and I am studying a few extra stars um, while these two actually observe. So I'm really just observing the observation, uh, but that's very exciting in and of itself. And you guys are doing that with me. So welcome. <laughs> and I'm Lara. I'm also a postdoc, but at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, even though I'm originally from Australia. And Margaret is letting me observe a few stars at the same time as she is. It's great. Teamwork makes the dream yes. work. <laughs> yeah, and you know, to, uh, earlier today, it's the first time that Liv, Margaret, and Lara had been up to the mountain. We didn't go all the way up to the summit, but we went two thirds of the way up to um, Halepohaku, the mid-base level, where, um, so we got to be on the mountain that we're, um, that the telescope's located on. Um, Carlos, did you want to introduce yourself, please? And, and then if Julie joins, I'll yes. have her do the same. Thanks, go ahead, yeah. Carlos. Yeah, so I'm Carlos Alvarez, and I am uh, one of the staff astronomers for the Keck Observatory. So my role here is to uh, monitor the observations and to give support for Raja, Margaret, Lara, and Liv on their observations, and just be available in case they had any questions or in case there are any technical problems with the instrument that they are using with DEMOS. And then I'll I'll jump in and and try trying to help uh, uh, troubleshooting those potential issues. So just making sure that the observations are smooth and that they got, have a great experience observing with Kek. Thank you, Carlos. Um, let's go around the Zoom room. Amarufa, you're first on my screen. If you wouldn't oh, mind, hi. please go ahead. Hi again. Uh, my name is Marufa Bhuya. Um, uh, I'm currently in Honolulu now. Uh, I'm, uh, I founded a company named Everest Innovation Lab, registered in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, uh, I have an amazing project. I'm working on Lanai Island. We will talk to astronauts in real time when the ISS fly by. So I'm working on this project now. Also, I work for Hawaiian Astronomical Society as a like, board member at large for the last few years. Thank you, and I have attended a few a few uh, sessions. Um, uh -huh. Thank you. Good to see you all. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Uh, have you been in Hawaii for a long time, Marufa? Yeah, it's been ten years, but I travel almost like every year. I was in Nepal for three years as a visiting scientist at Tihuani University. I see. Um, and then I got Kathmandu? back in 2020. Yeah, Kathmandu. Kathmandu, beautiful city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm originally from Bangladesh. So I, uh, I lived here almost 10 years. Um, yeah, and then went to uh, Utah for an astronaut training program in the Mars Desert Research Station, also high seas. This is my high seas patch. Wow. Mauna Loa. Yeah, I did like few astronaut training, analog. Are you connected to school students in Bangladesh still? Would they be interested in no, something like this? No, I want to. I really need help. I founded this company. There is, it's very, it's been two years, but I want to like have a group. Like yesterday, I learned when um, a group in Ghana and a few places in Africa, they're like my dream places. And of course, Bangladesh. Yeah. So I'm looking for students so that I can give lecture, like practice yeah. talking. <laughs> but I'm also wondering if students would be interested in joining these sessions. If you know anyone who would be interested, please forward the information to them. Okay, sure. And maybe we can work together. You, maybe that, you yeah. could mentor me. <laughs> no. Sorry to ask in public, but of course, why not? No, no, I'm happy to help. No, this is our goal is to Thank bring you. this, bring these experiences yeah. to students everywhere, uh, anywhere yeah. and everywhere in the world. I remember I was like really little, like eight years old. My brother built a telescope, and we, uh, my older brother, and we saw the moon. It was like 
shining sands on the moon or something. I still remember that. <laughs> so oh. we have that like practice. Um, where are you from, Raja? I, I heard I'm originally from, from Kolkata. I'm from originally from Kolkata okay, in India, yeah. not far from Bangladesh. And both my parents grew up. In, yeah, both of my parents grew up in what is now Bangladesh. Yeah. Yes, yes, I heard uh, before. Uh, yeah, a few uh, in one of the se sessions. Yeah. yeah. So you were born in Calcutta. I was yes. And yes. then uh, uh, yeah, I was looking at the website today. I was just trying to learn. It's like um yeah, it's amazing. Nice to meet you. I don't want to waste time. <laughs> Thank you By the way, I have one question. <laughs> I was yes. thinking all evening. What happens if it rains? Sorry to be so loud. I'm just excited. If it if it does rain, <laughs> long before it rains, uh -huh. as soon as um, so uh, we have Julie on the summit of Mauna Kea, who's physically at the telescope. Um, uh -huh. She is what is called an observing assistant. Now she could have been operating the telescope from here, right where we are at 2,500 feet. That's the elevation of. The headquarters. Right. That's where we are. That's where Lara, Margaret, uh, oh, wow. and I are. We are not actually right at now. the summit. We're not at the summit. We are in. We are at Waimea at Keck headquarters. Oh, that's where we're cool. working from. But if you know, as soon as there's any kind of sign that there are clouds nearby or uh, the humidity is getting elevated, we have to shut down the dome to protect the telescope. And Protecting the telescope takes higher priority over any science observations we're trying to do because it's. But because I'm asking because it's raining here now. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, Mauna Kea is above many of the rain clouds. That's part oh, of why oh, it's not. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. It's you. raining in Waimea also, but but Mauna Kea is above the cloud level, or it was raining in Waimea. Um, and thank you for collect uh, connecting, uh, Marufa. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. As well, we go to Rob next, please. Rob, you get tired of introducing yourself. You're, you're such a regular on STS. Appreciate that. I don't know if Rob's still there. Uh, I see Joshua next. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, Rob. Go I, ahead. Go ahead. I just I hit the wrong thing to start my audio. Uh, I'm Rob Johnson. I'm a mathematician, amateur astronomer, and programmer at UCLA. Uh, I've been to a few of the STS sessions and found out about it through the Griffith Observatory. Yeah, we had a fantastic session at Griffith in March, where we, at Griffith, we were on Zoom, but we talked about the concept of Shadow the Scientist, talked, I, I talked about some of the science, and then when the, they, they have a, every first Friday of the month, they have all space considered, so it was part of that. At the end of the session, right. they joined Shadow the Scientists in so uh, it was a lot of fun to do this at Griffith. So that's that's where Rob and I first connected. Thank you for being a faithful participant, loyal participant, steadfast participant in STS. Sure, I enjoy it. Um, Joshua, you're next on my screen. If you wanted to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, I would like to introduce myself. I'm from. Ghana, but I'm currently a student from um, at the Africa Regional Center for Space Technology Education. And I mean, you joined, um, you gave a talk at the Everything Astronomy, Raja, I'm talking to you, Raja, anyway. That's right, I gave a talk at the Ghana. Yeah, when you, when you gave a talk at the Africa, um, Everything Astronomy, monthly astronomy talk. You were there? With, uh, you were... Solomon I don't know if you can remember. Yeah, I was part of the meeting. So okay, okay. yeah, when I heard about it, and then, this is my first time having experience with um, observation in real time. Wonderful, welcome. I'll be leaving for Nigeria. Yeah, I'll be leaving for my postgraduate studies in Nigeria in January, which I'll finish in August for my global navigation satellite system course. Where are you I, doing I, your PhD now? No, that I'm just doing a one year master's program, um, yeah, which I'll finish in August. Okay. I guess uh, 2023. So I ever work on the CAT-7 radio telescopes, which is a precursor to the SK project worldwide for my undergraduate research, I where we image, the, we image the beam forming of the of the telescope and then this some um, basic uh, observation. I just, I just simulated some sources 
So I'm now into machine learning, trying to use it to clean. And then I realized that um, there is this project that's already been done already. So I just have to advance on it using the Decora software to, to clean the, the beam, the, the, the dirty beam of the, of the sources being observed. So I'm just looking for opportunities wherever I can find immediately after my master's or postgraduate studies in global navigation satellites with, uh, with um, fund, fully funded um, scholarship from the United Nations so that I can do a PhD either in the US or yeah, somewhere it's else. Wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is my first time experiencing this actually. That's great. <laughs> so I'm glad. Please yeah. tell me a little bit more about the radio telescope that you're using, whose beam you're cleaning. Is that so that, you said that, Pathfinder that, that was, for SKA? Yes, that was the that was my undergraduate studies. That was my work, the work I, I see. did and at my undergraduate studies. And the telescopes are located in South Africa. In South so Africa. So we just okay. use their open source data. So I'm currently in Ghana right now. Okay. But during my undergraduate project work, I took free data source from South Africa, a KAT telescope, which is which is a free um source. So that was what I used for my work but because there are no opportunities for me to directly go straight into astronomy or have a fully funded project directly in that field i was exploring options that i got admitted for this program that i've already started and i'll be finishing in august global navigation satellites which is also linked to space so i'm glad to be offering it so i can give you every information you need about the cat seven radio telescope apart from what i use the data to do yeah so, but I know, I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pathfinder to the SK project. Sure. And then because I work on it and the meerkat as well, and when you come to the technicalities, yeah, just, I can tell you some, some things you need to know about the telescope, but it's currently not widely being used because the SK project has already kicked off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. The, I know Australia has a pathfinder also. Uh, yes, Australia yes. has a pathfinder for SK. Yeah. Yeah. ASCAP, yeah. And then this is yeah. called meerkat. Yes, exactly. So yeah, that, that's right. So I mean, that, that was what I did as an intro to my career in astronomy when I was excited. It was wonderful. Thank you for connecting, Joshua. Yeah, thank um, you too. Yeah, please thank Sarah um, about C Masters because she's the one who made okay. it possible for me to speak at the Ghana. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, sure. I will do that. Thank you. Um, Alejandra, would you like to introduce yourself? I, I don't know if you've connected on STS before, but please take a moment to introduce yourself. Hi, um, I am an undergrad student through American Military University. Oh, wonderful. And I am connecting from Texas right now. Wow, how did you find out about Chat of the Scientists? Um, I took my first introduction class a couple months ago, and mm -hmm. I did a paper on the Keck Observatory. So I started following you guys, and I saw you post about this, so I decided to join. That's tonight. wonderful. I know Keck was advertising these sessions on their social media pages, so that's wonderful. So welcome, welcome. Thank you. Um, and, you know, uh, in a moment, we'll take questions from the group and share our screen. So I know Aria is connected to us through Margaret. Aria, do you want to introduce yourself for a moment, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Aria. I am a current high school student, um, a senior, and I got connected to this program or this live session through Margaret, like you said, who I worked with at Caltech over the summer this past year. And she was also um, my advisor for our club MESA at, at my high school. That's math, engineering, and science achievement. That's what that sounds yes. like, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Aria, for connecting. And that's all. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Kitsakoa Guatin and same as Aria, um, I was brought into this meeting through Margaret, whom I worked with um, over the summer. And she was also our MESA advisor and I'm a sophomore, sophomore in high school. Yeah. 
Thank you for having me. And Ketso Quartal, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. I had a student who's, who shortened his name to Ketso, but that's why I, I, I... No, definitely. You can call me Ketsal. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last but not the least, we have um, uh, Ms. Yulsta from South Africa. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Anisa Yulsta here from South Africa, Pretoria. I've been a former master student at UNISA, and currently we are working on uh, the contact binary stars WUMA, um, busy with, with an article, but I do have a daytime job, so this is actually just a strong passion. Thank you so much for a great opportunity to also be able to join you here this morning. And Annalisa, I have your coordinates, and we will try to, I forget, these are very bright stars, right, the ones you sent me? That's right, yes. They, they are, I think, all about so 12, 13 or less. Okay. I'll just have to check quickly, but, but, but they are very, very bright. And they've been, some of them have been well studied. And the first one in the list has got a bit of a quirkiness to it, which has been less, less well studied. Um, but it's also not classified as a, as a contact binary. Okay. I haven't had a chance to dig through. I saw your email. If you have a moment, if you could put, uh, you know, we're on two telescopes tonight. We're on a telescope at, in California and a telescope here in Hawaii. I mean, not, not the two separate teams that are on these two telescopes. And we might be able to get you a spectrum of that first one. If you could, if you could dig out its RA and deck and send it to me and its brightness in an email, it put it at the top of my inbox and I, we can try and get that tonight. We'll do that. Thank you what, so much. Do you remember it's RA and DEC by any chance? No, unfortunately not. I put them all in an Excel sheet. I'll just quickly go and retrieve that. Okay, that'll be great. Thank you. And I'm in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to go join the other. Um, can we turn a camera around towards the yeah. thing, maybe? Okay. Let me this. All right, I'm turning my camera around so you can kind of see our control room uh, set up here. So we've got these four monitors with a bunch of different displays. And in this one, we're, you can actually look at the images. So this is kind of, or this one right here is kind of the raw data that we're getting yeah. right from the telescope. Single 20 minute exposure, right? This is the first of the 20 minute exposures. This is the second, I guess. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can actually. I don't know how well you guys will be able to see this screen to screen. So, one thing that, so to look at this, um, it just looks like a bunch of lines. Actually, somebody said, I showed this to somebody and they were like, that looks like it's out of the matrix or something, you know? But basically what it is, is each of these kind of vertical lines that you see here, that's the spectrum from one individual star. So you can see there's a bunch of these vertical lines. So we have a bunch of different stars that we have these spectra of. If I can kind of zoom out, you can see the whole field of view of the telescope. So it's kind of a, it's kind of, you can see it's got like these, imagine, let me do that. Yeah. And so when we kind of zoom in, Roger, maybe I'll let you take over explaining. I'm happy to, happy to. All the spectra stuff. I might actually change the, let me see. Oh yeah, please. Do you, do you mind if I take this, uh, nope. pull this aside to the side yeah. and don't interfere with the, okay, let's see. I'm just going to need this. So let's zoom in a long way. So I'm going to change this threshold a little bit. Yeah. Too much, so let me try. It's not too much. No, what's going on here? Let me try 
let's follow that back to where we were, right? Mm -hmm. You said the control right click changes the stretch. Control. Oh, actually, I could change it here, right? No. It is, the control it is. R, you have to hold down control R and then right click and you drag to do the dynamic. Okay. But I don't know why it seems like some of this controls. Not working, right? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Can I, can I try? Can I Carlos try? Sorry, Carlos. I was I had my computer muted. Can you repeat what you're saying? Yeah, can I try real quick? Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, it succeeded a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let me just oh, I know that why it is. It's because you have the <laughs> setting for the uh pan tool. So uh -huh. you need to uncheck that one and now you do control R right click, it should change the contrast. Okay. And when sometimes it it looks like it has a lot of lag. So what you do is instead of uh, uh, right click and drag continuously, Just press you it can do it. it. You do it like a little little steps, like right. I mean, you do Control R, hold both, and then kind of right, right. click a little bit. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, uh, and panning is Control R in the left and left click or. Yeah, that's how it was yesterday, at least. You can just click on that hand that is at the bottom, and, and that's it. Yeah. Oh, it seemed like it worked yesterday. Oh, it's zooming in. I don't want it to zoom in. Uh, then the other one that you can use is the one that is to the left of the hand. Yeah, and that one wants to meet. Are you trying to control R and then do it, maybe? No, you should just be able to uh, left click wherever you want to. So um, oh, maybe you, you have such a large zoom. Let me zoom out. Yeah, yeah zoom out a little bit. Oh. Okay. And if I wanted to center where my cursor is up here. I think, I, it's middle, I think it's middle click. Middle click. Oh, there we go. There we go. I was doing a left click. Okay. So, so you can, I'm going to zoom in on, let's say this star here. Let's see if you can see it's calcium triplet. So in the spectrum, we can see specific uh, lines or gaps based off of individual elements or yeah, mostly elements that we can see that are in these stars that are kind of in the atmospheres of these stars. So Raja has a lot of experience looking at spectroscopy so we can look at these raw images and identify specific elements um, in the patterns here. So he's looking for calcium in these stars. You see, the, the, something about the display is really bothering me. It's yeah, weird. it feels different. Yeah. Oh, there's a slash sorry, in there. Sorry. Yeah. There's a calcium triplet line right there. But it's really painful and difficult to see. Here's, here's a calcium triplet line right there. Mm. So if I click on it and zoom in, You can see this sort of pinch, yeah. But I, I hate this display. What? Yeah, you, you might need to bring the cut high a little bit higher, something like maybe three thousand. Okay, I'll try that. Mm -hmm. Go for it. And now, and now, play with the contrast dynamically as you were like control. So you, you might need to. Uh, oh, there we yeah, go. Uh, that works better. 2,000 may be a bit too high. I'm going to try 2,000. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that looks better, yeah. One of the calcium triplet lines. This is the second one. Mm. That's the third one. Oh. And this is the strongest of the three. Yeah. This one is coincident with the night sky line, but that's just luck of the draw. No, not luck of the draw. I guess it depends on the velocity of the object. Sometimes the velocity is negative enough that it moves it out. But that's that's definitely a calcium triplet. Line. We should be able to see this on the other objects as well. If I click on, let me zoom out. Yeah, you know, you'll see this uh, in all the stars. You'll see the calcium triplet. Look at this one there, yeah. there, and there. One, two, three. Um, yeah, so I'm going to center it on this one and zoom in a bit. And so. 
this is oops this is one of the lines so the second line this is the third one okay so if i click, middle click on this and zoom in it should show us only the lower line okay see this line yeah this line. and then if i go up here and see the third line wow. um this is good can measure. I mean, this is single twenty-minute exposure is giving us all this information. The other thing we can see very clearly in these spectra, without having to look too hard, is the atmospheric effects effects of the A band. So let's see if we can pull that out. This is an absorption by the Earth's atmosphere of starlight, and best place to see that is in the this is central wavelength is 72 so it's yeah. a little bit lower than this it's somewhere somewhere here and this is 72 here so it's somewhere up here Let's see if we can spot this oh yeah there it is right there so i'm going to zoom in on this particular star it's hard to see without zooming in So you see how the light of the stars just disappears yeah. and then comes back up gradually. Uh -huh. This is caused by the Earth's atmosphere. This is the A-band. Mm. It was discovered by a famous German spectroscopist named Fraunhofer, and they call the Fraunhofer line. He was studying yeah. the sun. He noticed these absorption lines, and he realized that when the sun was low in the horizon, uh, these lines were much stronger than when the sun was up. He realized they were caused by the Earth's atmosphere. So the A-band is not, nothing to do with the sun itself, but the fact that it's being observed through the Earth's atmosphere. So that's becomes important for our calibration of the mist centering. Now you'll notice over here, if we zoom in, I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit here, that you'll notice there's a gap in the spectra. So wavelength runs along the vertical direction and you'll notice there's a gap. This gap is because the spectrum is across two different detectors, two different, look. Um, the gap is where my cursor is right there. You see this vertical band of, no information. It's because the spectrum is mapped across two different. Let's see if I can get this to work better. Mm -hmm. That's better. Yeah. Much better. This is what I was trying to get to. Good. Do you see this gap here? Is because there are two pieces of silicon that have a gap between them. And there are also gaps in the horizontal direction. This is one of the gaps. This is actually a missing slip, a slip that didn't get nailed. The other gaps, this is another gap right here. Gap between, oh, we were already on this gap. Here's another gap. There should be three gaps because this is one gap here. Yeah, so now we're in the right part of the frame. So there is eight silicon devices, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the gaps between one and two are, um, you know, that's that's this gap over here where my cursor is, then the gap between two and three and three and four. We're, we're looking at in detail the gap between three and four. And so you can see that if we don't design any slits over here because they would fall in the, the photons will fall on the floor. There, there's no silicon device to pick them up. The silicon devices can only be uh, put so close to each other. They have all these electronics, amplifiers, et cetera, that have to, that they have to leave room for. This is the upper left CCD. These are char called charge coupled devices, CCDs, and then this is the next one. Yeah, I find this accordion shaped feature mm -hmm. in the night sky a great marker. This is where the third calcium triplet always lands. The second one lands over here, the third one lands over here. So these, these two doublets, they pick up the first and second, the calcium triplet lens, and this accordion picks up the third one. It's not officially called an accordion, it just looks like one to me. Thanks. Hi, Carlos. I think I just see you in video online. I cannot hear anything. Do you, uh, is uh, sound off or? I, oh. I can, can actually hear. Uh, the sound seems to be okay for me. Uh, I think I need so... to head control. Okay. I cannot hear you very well. You, I can hear you very like low volume. I see. Okay, we'll, uh, I'm wearing we're wearing masks here, so that could be part of it. Yeah. We had a COVID nineteen scare today <laughs> with one of the two of the astronomers who are in a different group, but they were using the same facilities. They 
tested positive. So, but uh, these horizontal bars over here in the spectra, these these horizontal bars, these are repeated images of our slit. And the reason they're repeated is because the Earth's atmosphere glows at a finite set of wavelengths, and every wavelength at which the Earth's atmosphere glows creates an image of the slit. So each of these horizontal bars is a repeated images of this slit over here. The next set, repeated images of the next slit and so on. I say repeated images because images at different wavelengths get mapped to different parts of the silicon device. Anyway, this is just a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, this is the blue part. And the blue part. This Raja, I, th I thought yeah. the skyline emissions. Yeah, that's right. But the skylines, the night sky, fills fill the slit, and uh, and they okay. create images of the slit, basically, at different wavelengths. And because the skylines come at finite wavelengths, discrete wavelengths. Each one creates a distinct image of the slit. If the slit were narrower, those lines would be narrower. In other words, if the slit were wider, those would be wider. In fact, some of the spectra are taken through uh, four by four arc second boxes. And you'll see, if you look at the night sky lines on those, they look very strange. I'm gonna see if I can pick up one of those. If you look at the alignment boxes, the night sky lines from those look very strange. Let's see if I can find one. You have to go to the upper part here. Yeah, see, see how the night sky. Yeah, because um, again, you know, uh, you get repeated images of a box now instead of of a slit, and there's even a finer thing going on here. If you look very carefully, you'll see that the even though it's a four by four arc second box, the images are not square. Yeah, they're actually rectangular. So this is a factor, something called anamorphic magnification. When you take spectra. The angular scale in the spatial direction and the angular scale in the spectral direction are not the same because the angle of angle of incidence and the angle of diffraction are not equal. In when it's a mirror, the angle of incidence and angle of reflection are equal. So this creates uh, a, a distortion. It's called anamorphic magnification. It actually leads to higher spectral resolution because you can see that if the slit were square. It, the, you know, in this direction, it would be the resolution would be worse. The fact that it's squeezed like that improves the spectral resolution a little bit. So you have to take all this into account when you do the A-band correction, for example. For DEMOS 1200 line weighting, that factor is about a 0.57 factor. So this divided by the, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this direction divided by that is 0.57. I don't know what it is for the 600 line weighting, but it looks like it's a little bigger than that. Or closer to one. But anyway, anamorphic magnification factor is something that not many spectroscopists worry about, but mm. it's something that I'm torturing you with. Mm. Yeah, but you can see you can really see that the lines are not enough square. They are narrower in the vertical direction than in the horizontal direction. And the 0.1185 arc seconds per pixel only applies in this direction, not in this direction. Okay, and these are cosmic ray hits, these individual streaks over here. This this one over here, for example, has been this is a high energy particle, protons typically, that strike the silicon detector and release electrons. So they have the same effect as light as photons hitting the silicon detector. So because of this, we take multiple exposures so that we can do anti-coincidence in these cosmic rays. These are alignment stars, just judging from the yeah. uh, night sky. Oh, we're all done with our third exposure, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, select the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> take this back. Katie, you said it's always a while back, Yeah, so for seven. I bet it is. 
Yeah, yeah, you yeah, did. Maybe a double introduction. Really? So we are, um, we're just about to switch to our next slit mask. So we're going to move to another field of stars still in the same galaxy triangulum. Um, so yeah. I mean, so it's it's about to it's reading out now. So should I tell? Uh, yeah, we can we can switch. Hi, Julie. I've uh, highlighted the next target. Let's do this. Um, I think we are we're we're reading out now. So um, can we please move there? Okay, okay. Thank you. And we should be able to. We should be able to do a uh, uh, two zero over there. And select the new mask. Yeah, please. Uh, Raja, can you uh, share the screen, or or I, if you want, I can share my screen. That would be amazing, Carlos. If you could please, because of my VNC VPN uh, problem, I can't. If you can share the screen, that would be terrific. Yeah, really amazing. Great. Which one of the VNC? Which one of the VNCs would you want me to share right now? The one that has the control GUI or the one with the sleep mask alignment tool? If you could go back and forth among them, that would be amazing. But of course, depending on what's convenient. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can share one at a time. Uh, so I'll, I'll do I'll do the sleep mask alignment tool for now. Okay. I will do that. We've already got the mask in place now, so you should be good. Yeah, yeah. If you do end up having an issue and need to take it out, I think the world is guiding. Gotcha. So you're guiding off the upper part of the. Uh, uh, yeah, I see that. I see that. Okay. All right. Sorry. We're ready to start. We're ready to start alignment. Cross align. Yeah, sure. All right. Carlos, if you want to share cross align, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, just to be seeing. Can you can you see my my screen sharing in there or? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay. Of course, of right. course. Okay. Uh -huh. Select target. You've got that already. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. A lot of things. And we can see the star that Julie's guiding on that in the one in the upper part. This looks okay. They all look good. Yeah. So, what, what Margaret is doing is doing sort of approximate alignment of this telescope so that the metal plate, the holes in the metal plate sort of line up with the stars. And then we do a, a finer alignment. So we do a coarse alignment, which is finished already. Now she's starting a fine alignment. And you'll see uh, in the screen that Carlos is sharing, you'll see that um, the software takes these square boxes, four by four arc second square boxes. And an arc second is 1 60th or 1 60th of a degree. It takes it makes sure that the star is perfectly centered within that. And if it's, it, it reports how far off center the star is in X and Y. And you'll see that in a moment. Uh, it'll read out in a few seconds. You heard exposure complete. Carlos, are you sharing sound by any chance? Uh, I think so. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Well, we are, so they might be able to hear it. When it you might be able to hear it on. anyway. Yeah, you heard exposure complete. Now it's going to say read out complete in a, in a few seconds and then, it does some analysis of this image to see how far off each star is in X and Y. You see these boxes, pairs of boxes. Each please, pair is please, for a star. Please. And the left is for the X centroid. Right is for the Y centroid of the star. So about, you can see that the star is off to the left in X and too high in Y. But it should be fine. We should be able to do a... You already think about star two. It looks really lumpy, but maybe I just do another send moves and retake image. Yeah, because it found the it found the peak fine. Yeah, yeah. So I, and the seeing looks good. We didn't measure the seeing on the last one, but let's let's measure it on okay. this one. Seeing looks good. Yeah. It's really uh of course if the star is being sliced in half, it might be making the seeing look better. <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see. It, it actually looks good. It it looks sharper than it's been any of the previous nights. And seeing is a term used to quantify the degree of blurring of the star by the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, so what, what that graph meant, uh, Marufa, is it, 
it took a cut across, it actually collapsed the information. So it took intensity as a function of X and intensity as a function of Y for, the, for each of the alignment boxes. And if the star is perfectly centered, those peaks should be at the center in X and center in Y. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And the boxes are small, four arc seconds. Again, one arc second is, you know, the moon is half a degree, 30 arc minutes. This is one fifteenth of an arc minute, four arc seconds. Oh, good. Uh, Much... It's a little bit rotated still. Yeah, I would do another send moves retake because it was. Yeah, you're right. It, and the moment there's a rotation it means the translation also has to be yeah. adjusted because you don't know where the center of rotation is. So yeah. it's a good idea to, to send moves and retake. Um, one of my colleagues at the University of California taught me something very interesting about arc seconds. So he explained that no, an arc second is one sixth of an arc minute, an arc minute is one sixth of a degree. These units sound very much like time units where you have hours, minutes, and seconds. And apparently the word minute comes from minute, which means a small part of. So that's why a minute is a small part of an hour and an arc minute is a small part of a degree. But the reason it's called an arc second or a second is because it's the second time you divide the unit. And apparently in Newton's Principia, there's references to third minutum, which is one sixtieth of a second. That's the precision which, with, at which there's there are our glasses could time things. Why sixty? Because it's divisible by so many numbers. That's wow, it's like perfect in X. It's really good in rope, but now it's a bit translated in Y. So I think we need to send moves to retake again. Send moves only should be fine as long as yeah. there's no rotation. As long as there's no rotation, okay. should be good. And All this. right, so I'm going to go ahead and restore this then. Perfect, perfect, yeah. I'm going to share the, the control GUI now. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then, and then set up name. this, right? Yep, yep, exactly. And this time it can be a GUI 3. Uh, I think you have to apply the way. Ah, thanks. Oh, you're right. Always That's forgetting good. that. Very good, very good. I've done that so many times. Mm -hmm. I forgot. All right. Keeping us on track. And now you are. You are. <laughs> it was so confusing because when you ordered that sandwich, there was someone named Nora mm -hmm. who had a big sandwich. And I was about to take her sandwich for you, but then she rescued it because she's Nora. And I thought they were calling your name. <laughs> Lana. <laughs> Lana Lord. All right. So we just finished aligning the new uh, mask on the sky and we just sent the commands to do another hour long exposure so these are really long exposures it's like you know if you're taking a picture with a camera it's like the shutter would be open for an hour although we're doing it in three 20 minute chunks um but that's because these are really faint because they're very far away and so we have to spend a lot of time collecting light from these stars in order to get the information we need in fact in that image on the screen there you can see the image of the star through the slit in that uh in the second you want, you want me to change to the um to control um, yeah that'd be great yeah, we'll do mm -hmm. oh and then after that we'll ask you to change to control two because we'll measure the scene oh yeah which is very good oh, yeah. right now okay let me go first to control one and so it's really Great. Um, Mention of those things is breathing new life into me now. Oh, I'm yeah. order. I'll go and grab it. Oh, there we go. Nice control one. Right. So, what do you want to say about this? Oh, yeah. Just wanted to say that look, uh, you can see an image of the slit, and you can see that there's a star shining through there. In yeah. fact, there's a companion star to the left of it that also happens to be shining through, but we'll be able to measure a nice spectrum of that star and the star in that image is not perfectly centered but this was actually it was as good as it gets because we're not the offset we're applying now is in x only not in y so you're seeing a blob that's been cut by a rectangle that's what you're seeing over there no no the offset we're applying now is in y only not x right oh yeah y only so yeah so it might actually center it better yeah 
yeah, that's good, good, because the X moves it along the slit. So I bet if you go to our other slits, you'll see the same thing. I mean, if you move around there, you find other slits there. Oh, there you go. There's a second star in this lower slit, but the primary. And, and that's this one is of our guider stars. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. So alignment, alignment boxes are used to to line up the slit. Mind you, this is a 20 second exposure, you know, literally a third of a minute on a powerful telescope. But these stars, what are their typical brightnesses? Like 20th in? Uh, some of them are fainter. I mean, some of them are more like 21st, 22nd even. Yeah, and now in the visual band, let's say that's an eye. Yeah. So in the visual band, even fainter than that. So what is, so if, if it were, 22 and a half is not uncommon for Andromeda. So what is 22 and a half? The faintest stars you can see are fifth magnitude. So this is another 17 and a half fainter. And 17 and a half is three fives to three hundredths. So uh -huh. that's a million and another 10. So they are 10 million times fainter than the faintest star your eye could see from a dark site. And, and yet in 20 seconds, a 10 meter telescope picks up and it looks like it's really bright it's it's not you know for, compared to the human eye this telescope is so so much more powerful of course the human eye can't integrate for 20 seconds if mm -hmm. it could we'd be eaten by tigers a long time ago mm -hmm. so we have to refresh uh, that's part of our survival strategy but the telescope can stay and in this case it's staring for 20 seconds the spectra we're taking will be 20 minutes and three times 20 minutes will um, yeah you could see very clear signal Beautiful. This is all going really well. Oh, yeah. So we're going to measure the seeing now, Carlos. If we could please go to control two. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me just. I realize one of the stars is off. You see, look at star. Sorry, if we go back to that for a second. One of the stars, look at star three. Oh, five, five. Sorry. It's way off in Y. Mm -hmm. And you know, this could be due to proper motion. These stars are bright enough that some of them are Milky Way stars that have proper motion. But okay, okay. So I'm sharing I'm sharing control too. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So, oh, this is great. I, so yeah. seeing is better than I think it's 0.5. So what we're doing now is we're able to like take the, the so you can see on the screen here um, in that bit, that black box at the bottom and then the upper box, right box is a zoom in of that. So this, the white spot is a star. And then these little circles are kind of showing different radii out from the center of that star. And so we're able to look at a radial profile, which is basically saying if you start at the very middle of this circle and you go outwards, how bright is the star on the image. Um, and from that, we can calculate the seeing, which is, as Raja mentioned, it's kind of a measure of the blurring of the star. So when you look up at the night sky with your own eye, you see that stars are twinkling and that's because of motion in the atmosphere. Um, and so we can kind of have a numerical way of measuring kind of how twinkly these stars are. And ideally we want them as less, as untwinkly as we can. Yeah. Um, and so we can kind of measure, and the twinkling essentially broadens them out in the images. Um, and so we're able to measure that using these radial profiles. So it looks like this is what, this is like 2100. So that would be like. So it reports the full width half maximum of the fit. On oh, 5.73. 5.73 multiplied by 0. 0.12 is 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7 arc seconds. Yeah. Yeah. If any, yeah. 0.68. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Sorry, I, I want to say that um, you probably want to have the purple, the outer sky ring. Oh, I forgot smaller. to drop that down to 15. You're right. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not getting that much better. So it, it dropped the full width half maximum a little bit. Yes. Yes. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. How much is that? Yeah, so this number that we're quoting is the full width half max, and that's essentially a measure of how broad that uh, the spread is on the, the star on the image. You know, if you think of a 2D bell curve, if you go to the peak and go to half the intensity of the peak, that's why half maximum, and you measure the full width, not the half width, but the full width. FWHM is a very common statistic in in all, all kinds of areas, including astronomy, FWH and full width at half maximum. And that's what's being quoted in arc seconds in angle. And let's try another star. I, I bet some of the stars are better yeah. than this even. 
This one looks like it's got a lump on that. Yeah, it does. It does. So this, this is a crowded area, of course. Comparable, or oh, this is worse, 6.51. Yeah. Okay, let's keep. And so good. there are a couple of things that vary across, right? One of them is the focus is slightly variable. Oh, that's across. better, 5.44. Yeah. And so this is probably closer to the native seeing and then because of focus variation and also because of neighbors, as you said, it's a crowded field. So yeah. And the neighbor is not the atmosphere's fault. So I think mm -hmm. looking for isolated stars. Yeah, this is great. Look, this one is a 5.0. That is, tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. I have to do this in my head. You're, I, That's a nice you're one. better at the mental math than I am. Point <laughs> five nine. Point five nine. Two five. Yay! Wow! Nice. Right. But that's that's halving. That's halving point one one two five. Right? It's five point oh. So it's yeah. It's still, I'm impressed. I swear. Oh, this one really not the corner up here for some reason. That's the one that was offset in Y. Remember that was star five. That was offset. So uh, this could be proper motion or something like that. You know. This one's better centered. I think most of them are centered fine. That that one is just off. Yeah. This thing's good. Things good. Yeah. Hard to know what it is because it's varying from star to star, but I think some of that is crowding. Yeah. So sometimes, even though we try not to, we accidentally get more than one star, or we don't realize that the star we're looking at is actually a binary. There might be another star really nearby, so it can kind of skew our measurements. But it looks good. Looks like we're, we have really good conditions. We were worried because actually at the beginning of the night, when we came in here, you started at 2.30 in the afternoon doing all of the calibrations on the instrument. And it was really cloudy and it was actually raining or precipitating <laughs> up there. Um, and we have this whole kind of control system thing in here. You can see up on this screen that has all of these numbers that say things about the humidity and what the difference in temperature between the dome and the outside. And so you have to make sure that all of those conditions are in a good spot that you can open up um, because otherwise, you know, as was said before, these telescopes are incredibly expensive instruments, so we can't open them if they're going to get wet and ruined. Oh yeah, Carlos is sharing that. So, so that one um, in the upper right has kind of all the details, and then the 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 um, the box in the lower right. If there, you see those green num the things that say like SEC do and outdo and precip, those are the things that we kind of really want them to all be in the green. If they drop into like the danger zone, they turn yellow and then red. And that means you're not allowed to open the dome. Yeah, and PRI stands for primary mirror. And uh, it's the dew point of the primary mirror. SEC is a secondary mirror, the temperature at the two mirrors. Out is outside. And pre precip falls is good, of course, mm -hmm. not raining. Yeah, um, it was precip true when we first true. came in today, yeah. yeah. True. And the humidity is very low. It was 95% earlier and now it's at 36%. So we might have been just like moving through a cloud or a cloud yeah. was moving through True. us. Yeah. <laughs> and there are a couple of questions on the chat. There are a couple of excellent questions on the chat. One of them is Annalisa has asked, this looks like the aperture photometry tool. That's exactly what it is. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in order to measure the brightness or full width half maximum of a star, you first have to define the level of its surroundings. The surrounding level is not zero because it's glow from the Earth's atmosphere. So that's what that inner and outer sky annulus were doing. And then once you subtract that off, then you, you're left with the star alone. You can measure its brightness and its full width half maximum. That, that, that was a Gaussian fit. And then Lodric had a great question about what are beam size and beam area and why are they important? Now that's a phenomenon that is relevant to something called interferometry for radio telescopes, where you use multiple telescopes in conjunction with one another. And uh, uh, an easy way to think of it, let me think about how, a good way to think about is it, if you consider two different dishes, not, not in this case, Meerkat is a, an array of dishes, so is ASCAP, so is the VLA. But imagine you have two radio dishes that are pointed straight up at the, at the sky. And you have a star that's directly overhead. Now, a plane wavefront, in this case, a radio wavefront from that star, is going to strike these two dishes at exactly in phase, right? So, because you know we've set it up so the telescope is pointed, and it doesn't need to be directly overhead. As long as the two telescopes are pointed at a star, 
that's directly in the center of the field of view, it, the plane waves are going to hit the two radio waves together, and there'll be constructive interference from those two. Now, imagine there's a second star or second source that's slightly offset in angle from the, the primary star. Its waves are coming in at a slight angle. So its wave, one of the waves, one of the dishes will receive the wave before the other one. There'll be a slight phase lag between the two. In, and if that phase lag is half a wavelength of the radio wave, you'll get destructive interference instead of constructive interference. So the, if you think about it, what matters, you know, how finely you can resolve two stars or at what angle destructive interference occurs depends on the distance between the two dishes and the wavelength of light. It depends on that ratio, lambda divided by the distance. So the smaller that ratio, wavelength divided by the distance of the two dishes, the better we're able to see fine detail in the radio sky. And that is referred to as the beam, the angular size over which a radio telescope's, uh, the angular resolution of, a, of an interferometric radio telescope is referred to as the beam, B-E-A-M. And um, there's a lot more to that, to radio interferometry. I was trying to give you a, a sort of a simple explanation of sort of constructive versus destructive interference and wave fronts and how, how that works. I started out as a radio astronomer using the very large array before I stumbled into optical astronomy. Mm. And it was a lot of fun. This was the radio telescope that's featured in the second half of the movie Contact. Um, it's, it's a wonderful array of telescopes. 27 telescopes in the New Mexican desert. And uh, it's so cool. These telescopes are 25 meters tall. And there's 27. They look like satellite dishes, they right? Look, they look like satellite dishes. And you know, when they're pointed, they're always pointed in the same direction. So they look like they're praying yeah, all together. No. You know, I've been there. I went there in grad school. Fantastic. And you know, this it's a, in some of these configurations, it's a Y shape. So there's nine in one line, nine in another line, sort of like the Mercedes symbol. Um, the, the sort of, um, that's the configuration. And one of the cool things, one of the coolest things about the BLA, if you stand near the center and you look along one of the arms, because these are exactly the same height and because the BLA is constructed on an ancient lake bed, so it's completely flat, you can actually see the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> you can see that the tops of the telescopes don't form a straight line, they form a curved line. Um, and it's they're sort of logarithmically spaced. As they get further away, they're also further apart. So they look... Uh, they, all, they look sort of uniform when you're looking from... And they're on those tracks, right? They're on those tracks, because you can change how far yeah. they are. They're different A, B, C, D configurations. It, I was very lucky that in my second semester of grad school, I got to go to the BLA, and that was my research project. And wow. It, you know, if, if I wasn't into astronomy, something like that really, you know, yeah. it's so immersive. And I, I remember going to the New Mexican desert and seeing Halley's Comet. It was clear over there, dark over there. Just beautiful. Wow. Beautiful. So cool. Um, Vivan has joined after we've done introductions. Vivan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Who have we missed? We've got, it. We've got everyone else to introduce, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. These are great questions you guys are, uh, guys are asking. So anything else you want to ask, do, we'll do our best. Uh, Marufa, is your audio okay now? You can hear us fine? Yes, I can hear you. I have a question now that I have a chance. <laughs> so no, you, can, you can hear me. Is it too loud? Sorry. No, you no, can hear you fine. Great. You're not too loud at all. Okay. Uh, so Andromeda is like 4.2 light years away, right? Uh, no, Andromeda is two and a half million light years away. Um, oh, okay. Never mind. Oh my God. Away, so dumb. How far? Sorry. Two and a half million light years is Andromeda. 2.5 million light years. Okay. I'm looking at is 2.7 million light years. Uh, so I have a radio license, uh, you know, a ham radio, huh? yeah. WH6GNE. So radio um, travels at the speed of light, right? Mm -hmm. Radio signal. Yeah. Yes. That means 
that means so that's kind of like quantum entanglement theory i was listening to this nobel prize winner i mm -hmm. i like that story really like mm. so that means um uh, it's kind of like a small story, but not really story. It's like a condition I want to explain. Like, so let's imagine uh, we have like two balls. <laughs> One is uh, red and another is green. And we uh, cover it in a black box and separate it in million light years away, right? One is in our galaxy and another in Andromeda. So, as soon as we open the box in our galaxy, we, if we see it's red, that means instantly we will know that the other ball, how far, whatever the distance it is, it's green, right? Based yeah. on the conditions given. Uh -huh. So that means, uh, I'm just trying to understand how, uh, kind of, so radio signal, if it, uh, so it goes at the speed of light, that means we can just send signal anywhere in this, whole linear Kia cluster universe, like anywhere in this whole universe. That's correct. At the same time? Not at the same time. So if you send out a radio signal now, if you send out a pulse of a radio, uh, you know, pulse of radio energy, yeah. uh, it travels at the speed of light. So two and a half million years from now, it will reach the Andromeda galaxy, unless the galaxies move closer to us between now and then. In two, two oh, and you, were, you were saying from our perspective, right? Yes, yes but, exactly. I mean, let's say I'm not in here on Earth. Let's <laughs> say so I'm on the moon. It will yeah. be different. I mean, based on it's like theory of relativity, right? Like how the train moves or I move. But my uh, question was, um, as soon as I open the box here, regardless of wherever I am, whoever, at the same time, both will be, uh, uh, I mean, the signal goes at the same time, not from my, per so the time is an illusion, right? So I'm just trying to say, like, the signal goes exactly at the same time, however far it is, distance doesn't matter or does it matter? Depends <laughs> on what signal you're talking about. If you're Radio, radio. If you're talking about radio signals from a radio source, depending on how far away it is, Mm -hmm. uh, it would have had to have traveled for a certain length of time that's proportional to how far away it is before it can reach us. So when we look mm -hmm. out in the universe, we're looking further and further back in time, depending on how far away something is. And there's an analogy that I've used before. I'm, I'm going to try this on you. Mm -hmm. um, today for the Shot of the Scientist, you all showed up at our time. It was... 7.30, okay, in Hawaii. You all showed mm -hmm. up at 7.30. Now suppose, instead of joining Zoom, suppose you had all showed up at Keck headquarters at 7.30 p.m., okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to pretend each of you is a photon. You travel at the speed of light, whatever your travel speed is, and we're going to pretend the speed of light is analogous to your driving speed. So you all arrived at Keck headquarters at 7.30. That's like an astronomer collecting data. We're collecting data at a certain instant. And so you all arrived at 7.30. But you, Marufa, you came from five minutes away. You came from CFHT headquarters, which is a five-minute drive away. Mm -hmm. Carlos came from Waikoloa Village, which is a half-hour drive away. And let's say Lordrick drove at the same speed from Tanzania, and it took him five years. Mm -hmm. Maybe not five years. That's too long. Mm -hmm. Maybe two months traveling at that speed to reach us and you all reached at the same time at 7.30. Now, if I ask you, what are the conditions at your home when you left your home, your information would be backdated by five minutes. So you would report on the condition of your part of the universe when it was 7.25 p.m. because it took you five minutes to travel here. Carlos's information would pertain to 7 p.m. because it took him half an hour to travel here. And Laudre, three months to travel at the same speed, information about Tanzania, he would convey. The, the assumption he has you don't pick up information along the way. Photons travel through vacuum. They don't pick up information along the way. The information they carry is from their source. So Lodric's information would be about 7.30 p.m. in Tanzania three months ago. So information oh, is updated mm -hmm. depending on how long the photons have had to travel. And Yeah, there's equation problem. We arrive at the same time when we mm -hmm. are making an observation. But 
they are backdated. Information is backdated by different amounts. Thank you for answering. My husband is back, so I'll be just in mute and listening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, Vivan, thanks for introducing yourself. Aprajita, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself if you're if you're able to? Um, hey, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I, I was uh, away from the keyboard. Um, are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah, we just asked you to introduce yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Aprajito, and I'm from India. Uh, I work with Raja. Uh, I actually work with Demos Radio, the data that you are probably seeing to it. Do you get any? I don't know. Um, and I basically work with the spectra of something called interstellar medium, which is this gas and dust that uh, you find between the stars in these massive galaxies like Andromeda or Triangle. And yeah, nice to meet you all. If you have any questions about my work, feel free to ask and I will try to answer in the chat. Oh yeah, Lordrick, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Yeah, please. Hey, hi. Uh, so I'm Lordrick. I'm from Tanzania, and uh, at the moment I'm working remotely as a postdoc for the Maria Mitchell Observatory in Nantucket. Yeah, and. Uh, Basically, I focus on ALMA data. And uh, so right now I'm working with ALMA data cubes and working with different uh, source finding algorithms to try and uh, sort of find the sources in the cubes and calibrate the, the algorithm to make sure that they're finding the sources correctly and not finding fake sources. And so, yeah, that's why I asked the radio question because basically I work with radio astronomy <laughs> a little bit more. Um, and to, to Rufus' question, Marufo was talking about quantum entanglement, which is a weird phenomenon. Uh, we study about it in quantum mechanics. And so basically she was saying there's a red box here and then there's a green box there. So yeah, we sort of know by every theory and calculations that the box is going to be green there, but the information to get to us will take as long as light. <laughs> but if there was someone there and we could find a way to sort of communicate with them, they would tell us that the box is green. That much we know. Maybe that's a little bit more explanation on the quantum entanglement phenomena. Thank you. Surprises about this, I think. The recent Nobel Prize in Physics is, has something to do with this. Thank yeah, you. That's that's good I'm not that familiar with it, honestly. Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> Someone give a talk about it right over my head. I have no <sighs> idea what they were talking about. Thank you. Yeah. So I have, I'm sharing now the control one B and C, uh, Raja and Marco. Sorry, I just wanted to have a look. Oh yeah, go. First exposure of the next month. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> just mucking, mucking around with the contrast for now. So we're checking out the data from the next mask. We just, since we had switched and we just took a 20 minute exposure and Laura's clicking around. We're both on two different control screens, but controlling the exact same screens. <laughs> and so she's checking out the data. And so I think you might know. Uh, yeah, Carlos is sharing the screen. I'm not sure how well I can hear you though. Yeah, maybe you can like translate for me. Okay. If I'm controlling it, yeah. Um, is this a single exposure from the new one? Yeah. Oh, and I think we can see maybe a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Lara's, if you can see where the little cross mouse is on the, it's kind of on that second to right hand column. Um, she's pointing out that there's like a, a vertical white stripe. That's kind of what we call the continuum. So that's kind of the, con that's like the the light that's coming from that star kind of across all different colors. And then 
there if you see we're kind of in the middle of the screen there's like a very faint gap in that vertical line and that's an absorption feature so that basically means that there's um an element in the atmosphere of that star so the light the kind of pure white light essentially is being generated in the core of the star from nuclear fusion and then it has to pass through the outer layers of the star and in that process specific elements will absorb light at very specific colors or wavelengths and so that gap that we're seeing is kind of the fingerprint of a specific element in the atmosphere of that star that's absorbing the light that's singly on as calcium in fact it's uh, below, above the ground state there are three levels uh, very close to each other and this is the one that goes to the middle level because it's yeah. the middle of the calcium crystal but if you look at the uh, the spectrum on the far right you see all these corrugations in it that's a carbon star mm. you can see that in the raw data yeah you know there's so there's the molecule that's producing most of that is cn cyanogen so carbon and nitrogen combined into a molecule and they have the whole series of energy levels that electrons can uh, go to so there's many of these transitions that are very close to each other yeah, uh, I guess when you have a molecule, the vibration of the molecule and rotation of the molecule produces these sort of split energy levels, depending on because the the degree of rotation and degree of vibration is also quantized. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're seeing in that. You see these very fine corrugations on the far right. That's definitely a carbon star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to clarify a little, so when we're talking about just because we've got a wide range of experience on the call, so. In the inside of like the atom you have in the nucleus, the protons and the neutrons, and then you have the electrons that are in orbitals essentially around the nucleus. And what happens is a specific photon or light particle will interact with an electron. And so if you have an absorption feature, then a, then a photon will get absorbed by an electron, which will actually move it up to a higher energy level. And so that's why we kind of have that specific energy level. It, it's like it's only going to absorb the exact amount of energy it needs to move up to the next level. So that's why we have these kind of very specific lines missing. Um, and you can see, so the the kind of the middle one that we pointed out is a specific, it's a specific transition of an electron in calcium. And then Raja was describing in the right column, if you can see, there's a bunch of kind of faint lines in that vertical, like faint dark spots in that vertical white line. And that's from um, a molecule of carbon and nitrogen together. And because it's a molecule, it's a little bit more complicated. There's kind of more different energy transitions that those electrons can take. And so you have more absorption features. I wish I had a spectrum for carbon star lined up here on my screen. Uh, but yeah, they look amazing. These wild orientations for them. I wonder if I can just Google one. Don't have it. Here, are these? Maybe I'll let you, I'll share my screen and let yeah, you explain. Exactly it. Yeah. So, All right, Carlos, I'm going to take over. Can I take over the screen share? Sure. Let me just stop sharing. Okay, all yours. Are you able to zoom in to the right part? Oh, yeah, there you go. So um, you'll notice that um, if, you, if you zoom in on any one of them, if you, yeah. So you notice that at, is that at 7,000? Yeah, this is 7,000 here. Yeah, so unfortunately, they don't go red enough, but that W-shaped feature where you have a spike at 7,000 and then two dips on either side, or, or like a series of dips like that, those are produced by cyanogen also. There's also CH molecules, carbon and hydrogen, and C2, carbon and carbon. And they produce these very sharp features. And you'll see that it's not noise. You, it's the same from star to star. I think you have multiple stars spectra pulled up here, right? And they all look um, yeah. They look very similar from one to the other. Yeah, and this graph is, is, is essentially the same thing as those raw images that we were showing before. So if, if you basically went from the bottom to the top, and measured how bright is the star at each of those vertical steps. That's basically what this plot is saying. So this is like the bottom of the image to the top of the image. And then the y-axis is here is saying kind of how bright is the line at each of those uh, positions. Yeah, in fact, our spectral coverage is almost exactly this. It goes from 4,500 to 9,500. So it goes a little bit further to the right. What's the difference, Raja, between the N series and the R series? The different uh, kinds of carbon, uh, carbon stars, yeah. 
one, one, what's in common is that the triple dip. Yeah, the W it. thing. Yeah, but see, the other parts are very different. Yeah. Different molecules, again, C2, CH, those are different. That thing on at 7,000 is CN. Mm -hmm. Cool. And there are molecular band heads. They're very sharp on one side and then gradually fall off on the other. They're crazy. They look like absolutely insane. Now, you see that, that W feature at 7,000 is so persistent across all of them. Mm -hmm. So the big emission line. That's H alpha emission. Yeah. Oh, Some, yeah. Sometimes they show H alpha emission. Hmm. Why? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Bizarre things. They, so they have outflows, and then okay. that gets lit up by the yeah. gets ionized. Yeah. And, uh, so carbon stars are often losing mass. So it's mass loss being lit up by the light from the star. Because mm -hmm. once it becomes optically thin and the mass loss, then it can get ionized by the by the starlight and. So that's H alpha and emission very clearly. You can see 5896 is the, which is the door mm -hmm. code of this building. Mm -hmm. That's that's yes. uh, sodium doublet right there. Mm -hmm. You see H beta in emission at 4861. You see mm -hmm. H gamma in emission at 4340. Yeah. Oh yeah, here and there. It's cool. There's so much information in these spectra is just insane. Uh, our observatory director used to say a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures. It was a play on a picture is worth a million, as a thousand words. Yeah. Was a, um, but it, it's yeah. true. There's a lot of physics in, in spectra. Um, Aparajito, I see that your pipe run finished for A1M33P. I'm snooping on your, on, on cube control. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I was trying to submit another job last night, but uh, something went wrong and I couldn't identify it. Uh, I'm still getting used to editing the YAML file. Um, yeah, and I'm good also. If that yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah. trying to keep everything organized so that you know, uh, raw data and the uh, reduced data, uh, don't get mixed up. So what I'm going to do soon, hopefully tonight, is set up that Google Drive with promise because I need to upload oh, some right. data. From. Exactly. I was going to ask. I've finished a bunch that. of reductions, and I've been what I've been doing is after I complete the reduction, I copy them onto my laptop. I create a second copy on my server at Santa Cruz. This is Pemla, and then I'm creating a third copy in um, on uh, will be on Google Drive. And Marufa, my uh, computer is named after my dog, who was originally from Darjeeling, and therefore has the name of Pemla, which is a Nepali name. <laughs> Pemla, Tashi, and Fizo were the three. Kanchi, Kanchi was the mother, and Pemla, Tashi, and Fizo were the three pups. I learned some Nepali language and a few words. Like, if I want to say, how are you, you say, <laughs> I don't know if you went to, I know. I used to be hanging out with ministers and secretaries. It was fun. I, I feel so I happy if you just say that. <laughs> I, we learned to say, I don't want it. Because when we used to go to Darjeeling, people would peddle us things all the time. So we learned to say in, in Nepali, Pordoina, in, I don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yes, yes, I think so. Otherwise, Shanu, Tulo, and Tato are other words I learned in Nepali. Shanu means small and Tulo means big. Tulo, yeah. So what is it, which, uh, what country is your favorite in terms of your astronomy exploration and science research? Like what is your favorite um, work experience in which place or you would like to share? <laughs> so one of my favorite experiences, and I think it's only because it's in very recent memory, was uh, a trip I made two months ago to the small island of Molokai. It's not oh. often that I go to an island and I get greeted by lays and singing and chanting. So the students at the school received Evan, my, my former student and current collaborator. He and I got this royal reception on Molokai. And that has to be one of our defining moments in both of our professional careers. It's been not often that we go places and people sing for us and put garlands on us. So that was, was really special too. I did my research on Molokai Island, uh, my really? master's. Really? 
yeah water and energy nexus i literally walked the whole island it's very small it's but it's very, very yeah different the tallest sea cliffs in the world and but they don't place. have an observatory uh, there is a the mountain you know i've gone to for an outreach event uh, i've gone there to work with the students of the akaula school in on malakai and they have the leper colony there uh, what is it called kala uh, papa uh, one question since i have this uh, chance now uh, so mauna loa uh, there are volcanoes right is it not risky for astronomers to live there i mean it's better to build observatory on oahu or molokai or some place where less risk what do you think about that i th okay. i think about that many times yeah so first of all the height of the peak matters because of mm -hmm. course you, know, you have less air above you and you know the, there's less turbulence but also mauna kea is a very old volcano mauna loa is not as old but in terms of geological age one is younger than the other but in terms of human lifetime they're really old so my mm -hmm. understanding is these are um dormant slash extinct volcanoes so can, can i say that because yeah. of the height of yeah, sorry sure. very much but uh, yeah. Carlos, what is your what are your thoughts <laughs> so well even my experience uh, with earthquakes <laughs> so mauna mauna kea is <laughs> Mauna Kea is considered a dormant uh, volcano. Uh, there is a, another one nearby, which is Mauna Loa, which is actually an active volcano. And then okay. Kilauea, as uh, Raja was saying. So the main, you're right, actually, is not, it's, it is risky to build an observatory in a place like this. Uh, and uh, one of the things that the observatory does is to evaluate the potential of uh, different types of, uh, uh, in fact, the main, the main issue in, in the case of Mauna Kea can be earthquakes rather than volcanic eruptions. So they are classified, classified in terms of like a, a GR band, you know, what is the typical magnitude of an earthquake that you would have uh, on an average of a year and then uh, there are events that are stronger, that happen higher magnitude earthquakes that happen with less frequency. And um, we are, the observatory is prepared to up to events that can happen every hundred years or so. But if there is something there, um, uh, earthquakes that uh, can be uh, uh, even uh, more destructive, just destructive and, and higher magnitude, like what we call like a 500 year event. So in that case, it could be catastrophic for, for, you know, it could be hard for the observatory to recover from an event like that, but the probability of it uh, happening is, is, is very low. Um, yes. And one of the things that we do is uh, prepare on how to recover for certain events. So, um, Something that happens on a kind of regular basis is that uh, when there is an earthquake, for instance, if the telescope is observing, you can actually see the effect that actually the, the telescope is so massive, it weighs about 400 tons, that um, uh, it almost acts as a seismo seismograph. So uh, essentially, uh, the ground will start to oscillate and the telescope will kind of stay you know, like an inertial mass, it stays static, but the ground is is moving uh, on the background. Mm -hmm. And we had events in which the, the telescope was kind of moved off its rails, let, let's call it. And then it takes a it takes a few days to to recover from something like that. In some cases it has taken taken lo longer. And then a smaller events that don't have that much impact, we still have a procedure to check out all the instruments, check out the full facility for potential damage. Uh, so that's something that we have to do uh, on, on a regular basis. So it is risky, but for the reasons that uh, Raja was talking about, the elevation, the geographical situation, the transparency of, transparency of the skies, there are uh, multiple uh, benefits of having the observer, uh, having telescopes on on 
on, on Mauna Kea. And kind of, so it's, it's, you put in balance, you know, in a balance the risks with the benefits and it's, it's totally, um, you know, the, the, the benefits are much higher than, than, than the risks. Uh, so, so that's uh, something we have to live with. And in terms of volcanic eruptions, as they say, Mauna Kea itself is not, is not a, uh, an active, it's considered, as I said, dormant volcano. Uh, but if you have an eruption in one of the volcanoes nearby, and in the seven years that I've had, uh, I've been living here on the island, there have been several eruptions in, in, in Kilauea, this other volcano that Fajia was talking about. Uh, you can have problems sometimes with the, the plume, the volcanic, uh, you know, the smoke and the ashes. So depending on what the, what the, the dominant winds are, if, if you get high number of uh, volcanic particles in the atmosphere, then it can, you know, it can make the, the uh, astronomical observations more difficult. Uh, so that is kind of the major risk in terms of uh, how a volcanic eruption can affect uh, uh, the observations. But uh, the observations, but we are not expecting that there is going to be like a, you know suddenly a, a lava flow, you know, like a, 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 a a, a, a cinder cone or a, or a volcanic eruption that is going to happen right at where the, the, the telescopes are. It'll be somewhere relatively nearby, uh, and we can get the effects of the ashes and volcanic, uh, volcanic ashes and, and smoke, but not not the not yeah not not like lava, for instance, like having a lava flow taking uh, the observatory uh, observatory away. <laughs> no, I'm not really afraid of taking some <laughs> of the material. Okay, so, um, it looks like you are a technical person. So I have one more question. Um, sorry, I'm maybe taking too much time. But um, so now they're launching telescope in the space, right? Now all this we have. I mean, we had space telescope before too. But do you think? Um, okay, this is not my question. My question is. Um, <laughs> um, so 30 meter versus eight meter or 15 meter, like what is the benefit of as it, like if we drill this mountain, sacred mountain 30 meter versus 15 meter, I don't know the exact process how to build a telescope, but what is the difference? 10 meter telescope versus 30 meter telescope? Yeah. Like, uh, or, or my question would be more like, whatever the current uh, uh, telescopes we have, and 30 meter telescope, I mean, do you think by the time we build this telescope, there will be already a space telescope and there will be no use of this GMT? I mean, based on our survey or economic evaluation? Yeah, uh, well, I can- Not very organized, but you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I can answer mm -hmm. that, Raja, but uh, if you want to answer, I'm, I'm happy. Technology advances you. like exponentially each day, almost seems like. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, so the the reason to build large uh, projects, you want to take it. I'm I'm happy to take it, but if you prefer to do it, I'll, I'll like, it. okay. <laughs> so uh, the reason to to build, so there are two two reasons to build large telescopes and uh, to one uh, to build larger telescopes. So one of them is uh, the amount of light that you can collect. So mm -hmm. the larger the area and um, and this is a very, uh, you know, it's the very standard analogy of how a telescope works, but this is essentially a bucket that collects light, that collects photon, photons. So if you have a bigger area, a bigger, a bigger mirror, then you have a, a larger collecting area, which means that you can collect the same amount of photons faster. And also you can collect more photons in the same amount of time, which means that you can observe things that are farther away or things that are fainter. And as Raja was saying before, like uh, when you look at things that are far away in the universe, you are also looking at the past of the universe. So you are learning about, about how the universe was in the past uh, because of the constant um, um, speed of light. Um, so, so that's a good. That's one good reason to build bigger telescopes. The other good reason is that um, the capacity of a telescope to be able to resolve to things that are very close together, um, like if you have two, two 
to points of light that they are next to each other and you want to see them as separate points of light is uh, proportional to the diameter of the telescope. So the capacity to collect phot photons is proportional to the area, to the surface. The okay. capacity to resolve two points that are separated uh, uh, is proportional to the, to the diameter of the telescope. So that's the other, the other reason why you want to build larger telescopes, because then you will have a more resolving power to be able to separate, for instance, like a planet from a star. You know, you have a star and a planet orbiting uh, around it. You'll have you'll do that job better with a larger telescope. So uh, definitely we always want bigger telescopes. Now the question is, where do you put them? Do you put them on the sky? Uh, in a you launch them in a space or to a space or you, uh, or you um, build them on the ground? So ideally, you put them on, you know, there is no atmosphere. So you don't have all the effects that the, uh, that the Earth's atmosphere has that you have to correct for when you are on the ground, um, you don't have things like weather. <laughs> you know, there is no problem with we cannot open because it is raining today, these kind of things. But uh, the problem is with launching on, uh, things to space is that it's very expensive. So um, the cost of la launching a small telescope to space is much, much higher than the cost of building a telescope on the ground. So just to give you an idea, the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope, it was almost uh, $10 billion. It's a project that it cost $10 billion. And this is a six and a half meter diameter telescope. The Keck telescopes, um, they are uh, 10 meters, so they are two and bigger. And the cost, I mean, it's, it, even if you correct it for inflation, because they were built like nearly 30 years ago, but still the, the cost of building it like a 10 meter telescope is more of the order of like a hundred million dollars or something like that. So you orders of magnitude cheaper to build a bigger telescope on the ground than uh, a smaller telescope that sending a small a, a small telescope sends uh, you know thank you. You, you, you can always have many more small telescopes uh, on the ground or even big telescopes on the ground than, than, than telescopes you can have in space. Unless we invent a, you know, we discover a, a more efficient way of sending things to space. I think ground-based astronomy is gonna be uh, winning the battle, let's say, you know, like a friend, <laughs> friendly, friendly battle uh, in terms of uh, how big you can build a telescope. So I don't know if that answers your question. And I don't know if you want, Margaret or our Raja, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I'm just learning. Thank you. It's a very sensitive yeah, job. Really well. to talk. But still, <laughs> it's you, very hard to learn. The analogy um, that uh, of those two radio telescopes side by side, the same principle applies to a la single large telescope. That is, if light comes in, at, at the wavefront comes in at a slightly different angle, um, one part, one piece of the aperture will see a different phase than the other piece of the aperture. That's what allows, that's that's related to the size of the airy pattern of a diffraction limited image of the larger the telescope, the, the finer the angular resolution. It's exactly related to this notion of having two separate telescopes, radio telescopes. It's, uh, it's constructive versus destructive interference of waves. Um, and I'll put you to answer your question. The CCD5 failure was, there, there were earthquakes that damaged the telescope, K, K1 actually, not so much K2. Um, there, were, there have been big earthquakes that completely destroyed this room they're sitting in. Um, yes. But um, the CCD5 problem was not related to an earthquake. It was an amplifier failure, right? That, and that um, has now been, uh, you've replaced, you replaced the ion pumps, right? And that yeah. brought it back. That is, that's correct. So we sort of improved the the vacuum in which these CCDs uh, uh, operate and, and that help uh, to, to fix that problem with CCD5. But yeah, as, as far as I can tell, uh, that, that issue with the CCD5 is not uh, directly related to an earthquake.
Oh, I wanted to say something to Annalisa. Hey, Annalisa. Thanks for sending the coordinates of the of the eclipsing the contact binary star. Um, I think we can try to get it at the beginning of the night tomorrow night. The way the LST is such that it'll be hard for us to get it now, but it's at 20 hours at so the beginning of the night instead of observing an RLR. Uh, it's it's uh, it's really bright. It's like sixth magnitude. We should be able okay. to get it before 12. 12 degree twilight. So we should be able to get you. Uh, it's a variable object, so getting a couple of hundred second exposures would be the beginning of the night, very beginning. And I'll try to get you more spectra with ESI in uh, later this uh, next Friday on a different spectrograph. So we'll, we'll thank you, Prof. That. Yeah, so sorry, go ahead. Wait, wait, when you say tomorrow night, um, what what time slot? Because I, I remember now. I'm, you want uh, you can connect to us, yeah, you can connect on shadow. We'll use the same I'm link coming uh, from South Africa. Around... I just want to check which, yeah. So uh, tell me what, what time is it for you now in South Africa? It's now 20 minutes past nine in the morning. Oh, so you're exactly 12 hours ahead. So if you connect, yes. we'll be doing this at 6.15 Hawaii time, 6.15 in the evening. That'll be 6.15 in the morning for you on a Sunday morning. It'll be Saturday okay. evening for us. Tomorrow morning or, tomorrow morning or Monday morning? Tomorrow. No, tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Sunday morning for you, uh, you and Saturday evening for us. It Excellent. won't be exactly at 6.50, but it won't be before that. It'll be slightly after that. No problem, because as I say, your times are actually quite convenient. It's morning for us. Yeah. So when you guys are getting tired yeah. as the e evening proceeds, we yeah. are getting awake. Yeah. Uh, are we doing on the exposures on this one? Is it we're one? on the third exposure for this uh, mask. See the line, another one, and then go up to Burger King. Yay. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. highlighted the next target, so mm -hmm. we'll align it when this is done. We're going to do another mask alignment. So, operator, one of my one of the pods crashed for me in a strange way where it said container not recognized or something else. So I'm just rerunning that part again. So that okay. And um, I just tried running uh, a job with A0 underscore one, the one we uh, discussed yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried using the second configuration because we agreed that one looks uh, yeah. right. Uh, but yeah, it failed. Uh, I think because PyBit can't recognize um, the file type or rather the, you know, the frame type for the um, calibration frames, uh, because some of the calibration frames were labeled none in the PyBit configuration file, if you remember. I told yeah. you, one way to fix that is go into the .pyBit files and directly edit it so that the... Um, Oh. R, say R comma tilt, you know, just copy that from a working pipe file. I found that okay. works. Okay. Okay. Basically, we'll do. It overrides the information. Uh, it, it couldn't, you know, I'm not surprised the headers were not well populated in the early days. You know, they were figuring this out and yes. pipe didn't exist and they were using different software. Yeah. So I found that if you go to a working calibration file, you'll see it says R comma tilt, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the plus say something something different about um, what I should say. Um, you know what I mean. If you go to a, a, yeah, a yeah. well, just copy that over, replace the none with that. I okay. found that one of my science images was marked none and wasn't being used and would crash. And I changed that to science, it started to work. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, Marufa, go ahead. You have a question for us. 
yes. Um, so uh, to build an observatory, uh, let's say, let's say my grandfather have a lot of lands in Bangladesh and anybody can build observatory in their personal prop land or do you need like some sort of permission? It has to be no, like a people, government land or something. Like how does it work? People have telescopes of varying power in mm -hmm. their homes, backyards. Um, the main thing to worry about, there, there are several things to think about when mm -hmm. you're going to put a telescope down is what fraction of the, if you're going to use it on a regular basis, you should ask yourself, what fraction of the time is there cloud cover? Okay. How often is it raining, et cetera? Because that will determine whether you need to protect that telescope in an enclosure and only open it when things are clear. And also, if it's going to be cloudy much of the time, then you, it's not an efficient, better to put a telescope in a place where you have dry weather much of the year. Second thing you have to worry about is light pollution. How much human-made light pollution is, um, you know, if there are lots of light from right, right. Mm -hmm. city, et cetera. So putting it in a place that's far away from <clears throat> human-made light uh, is a second thing. Um, that's and the cost. Expensive. Expensive, yeah. yeah. That's the third thing, yeah. But it's like a dome, it's like a mosque or something or a temple. You just have sets of mirrors, and do. I don't know really. I mean, as I mean, I mean, I visited few. I mean, the one we have in Utah, the desert, a mosque observatory, okay. and yeah, it's true. But, they're shaped like domes, but there's an important yeah. difference from a regular dome, which is there's a portion of that dome that can open. For the telescope to look through. Okay, there's okay in the sky. Yeah, yeah. So they have something like a garage door that comes out that that sort of opens slides out so that the telescope can look out into the sky. So that's right. an important element of a dome. But yeah, you're right. The dome is used to protect it from the weather elements. Hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, in you know, since Raja mentioned. Um, you can, and you also mentioned that you can just uh, put up an observatory uh, in your private land. Uh, some people do that, and they don't always have that dome. Uh, I've seen very, uh, you know, normal structures like sheds. Some astrophotography sees that. Uh, and they don't have huge telescopes, you know, like Keck. Uh, they're probably like maybe this big. Uh, and there are powerful telescopes which can be small in size, but they're still powerful just because of you know how the optics are set up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, building an observatory is not unfeasible. Uh, lots of astrophotographers do that. I mean, that's. I mean, uh, I'm not an astrophotographer. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm not an astrophotographer, but we have telescopes because I work for a society. How an astronomical yeah. society um, board members have telescopes. We set up star parties. You can just leave it. Uh, but the only problem is like opening the sky, like as Raja mentioned. You know, like how That's you right. see the sky. That's, That's right. the view. Mm -hmm. so thank you yeah. all. A very active shadow design discussion. This particular one has been regular. The last one, mm -hmm. Rob was the only one on. Huh. It, it was a sand theme, and Rob, but that was on the lake telescope. Oh, yeah. Uh... Power of check. <laughs> so we're not going to call that one an official SPS session. We're just going to do that. <laughs> I know we're at the two hour mark. Mm -hmm. Already. So, Already. Wow. This night's going fast. This session, this really was a very active session. Yeah. Arya and Kesal, do you, what were your impressions of tonight? What Margaret's work looked like? <laughs> I think they already had a pretty good idea of what my work looked like from the summer. True, true. This is the data collection phase. They were analyzing data, I assume. Yeah. Spectra. Not spectra. They were um, looking at HST optical counterparts to new star sources in Triangulum. Oh, wow. And trying to look for trends between what 
type of compact object we infer it is from the new star spectrum and what you know whether it looks like a point source so likely a high mass x-ray binary or a resolved galaxy or a cluster gotcha. well so i'm not sure they can hear you if because you're not you're muted over there oh, you're um yeah no we can we can hear uh throwing my voice from here <laughs> I'm used to yelling at my daughter. No, I'm just kidding. She yells at me most of the time. Rasha, did you uh, uh, did, have you discussed anything with uh, Liv about the Bells project? Unmute here. So what happened was um, Liv and I traveled together from San Francisco to Kona. And while we were waiting for the plane, I dug up some of my old emails. We found John's email. I forwarded him that email. I haven't heard back from him. But it looks like, so it looks like these, Monica discovered this, that four of the six stars we identified are previously known wolf ray stars in M33. So these wolf ray stars are massive stars that are undergoing mass loss, right? But yeah. um, at the same time, John didn't look at our spectrum and say these are wolf ray stars. So they, it, it's possible that whatever spectrum was used to identify wolf ray stars failed to notice these, but more likely there's been some evolution, time evolution. Uh, and that mm -hmm. spectrum was taken in 2018, the ones on which the six Bell's stars were found. Um, Bell stands for Broad Emission Line Luminous Sources, in case you're wondering. Uh, um, so last night, is that if we, um, Lara had put those stars on an M33 mask. You observed them last night? Number six, you said? Six. Mask uh, six of M33. Right? So, so we got it. Four years later, four years after our discovery of these stars, we've gotten another spectrum that we haven't analyzed yet, but I'll run pipe it on them soon. So we should have a time-based time. That might be an interesting thing to see if it's changed in these four years, or and also whether it's changed between the, we think the Wolfray discovery would have been a spectroscopic discovery. People would have had to have taken a spectrum. So it would be interesting to compare the discovery spectrum to a our 2018 spectrum to our 2022 spectrum. So let's see what John says. We're also waiting to hear back from him. But since I dropped the ball for literally two years, um, I have to give him some, I have to display some grace and give him some time to respond. So we'll see, see what he says. But I'm happy that we dis read this. Uh, I was able to dig up that old email thread. And yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, interesting to know that there can be some evolution some time evolution um yeah it reminds me of the you know recent JWST image i think that was a wolf rat star losing mass like in spirals in a binary um yeah i don't know if it will uh you know be something like that but yeah that that is interesting like that mm -hmm. i mean this reminded me of that you're on the correct mass now oh it's I moving. just it's changed moving. it yeah which one are we going to now 11 yep 11. so we're moving to m31 now oh okay okay so the first two were m33 oh, I missed that. nine and ten are m please share screen so that i can see <laughs> learn a little bit <laughs> maybe <laughs> i'm accessing from cell phone so oh, I have a limited access. No, it's not. It's oh, I see. Yeah, no, one, two, three, four were M31. Uh -huh. And then five, six were M33. Seven, eight were M31. Got you. Nine, ten right. are M33. Uh, and then. Very tricky. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got it. So it's number six. Month number six, M33. Total. M06 is the month. That's right. Perfect. 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 I'll run PyFit on them in there. This weekend, I'll start the PyFit run. Yeah. I promise I'll start working on them when I get home. Yeah, that'll be fun. Let's see what. Well, I'm gonna start working on them now, actually. But uh... okay, we're getting. All right, thanks.
That was very quick. Very good. All right, so I'll start my uh, course online. Maybe get that here. Carlos, you're welcome to share screen to uh, um, control two, please, if, if, if you can. Yeah, I'm on it. Oh, this looks good. Beautiful. Where are you? Okay, here we go. Beautiful. Shane. Well oiled machine. This is very quick. <laughs> I was like watching the numbers count down. So we didn't like that away. <laughs> it's so funny because I feel like it's such a hurry up and wait, you know, but yeah, you don't right. want to waste any seconds in between the masks. You kind of like have to sit around, but you really have to be paying attention to exactly Stuff, yeah. Yeah. what's going on. We had these two full nights in September. We observed no fewer than nine masks on one of the nights. Wow. When it was a full night. Right, course. right. Still. And Nine and eight, I think, are the two nights. So a lot of a lot of switching. When you do a full night, do you just sleep all the all day? <laughs> <Don't>, but, <laughs> you know me. One night. <laughs> uh, Not you, but someone one might. Yeah. <laughs> no, usually you're you're, um, you're done by around five something a.m. So it's not particularly, you know, but uh, that's you, awful. Yeah, <laughs> But let's see, we're starting at, we started at six, right? So you sort of end at six, it's a symmetric yeah. matter. So it ends about hours. six. Yeah. Wait. Do not get up at maybe 10 or 11. Yeah. If you're refreshed, <laughs> ready to take on the day. You're one of those people who requires that sleep. Too bad. Sleep um, <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's missing it for any of our stars. So I'm going to send moves and retake. Yeah, that looks good. And the scene continues to be good. That yeah. looks nice and sharp. Sure, believe our luck. I know. I feel like we've really been getting a fake out from the weather. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, having clouds stabilize the atmosphere. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, 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 I've always heard that, yeah. Makes sense to me. I'd buy that if you sold it to me. <laughs> oh, good. Aparajito, so you edited the configuration file and Pipe it picked up yeah. the car. That's good. Yeah. And you have to edit the dot .pipe it file, right? Yeah, that's right. And are you also one of the, I was making two edits to the dot pipet file. These were in my notes. One of them was putting in those parameters to say uh, turn off spectroscopic flexure correction. Yep. Other one is to move it to the observer, not heliocentric, and then changing the raw to slash temp slash raw. Yeah, that's right. That. And there has to be three uh, slashes uh, there. Uh, and you change the path. If you miss any one of the slashes, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't pick up the correct files. So it has to be slash TMP slash raw data slash. Um, that gave me some trouble yesterday. Still a bit off. Whoa, that's whack. With star three. I mean, it's finding the center of that, but there's two peaks. Should I just X that one out? You should X that one and find the wrong peak. Okay. That's super weird. And that actually removes the rotation, which is good. But I think I should still yeah, do another one more. And just, yeah, just remember to, yeah, three. Uncheck three. Yeah, three just has a uh, probably a neighboring star. Yeah. Oparajita, in, in the bucket I'm using, which is different from the bucket you're using, I'm not having to put a slash up the drop. Oh, well. My understanding uh. is raw is where it temporarily, temp raw is where it temporarily stores all the data. Yeah. Input parameters, and then it uses something called run dare to do the actual run. And then it copies everything back into a pod that's named after whatever you named it in the YAML file. And that's where I copy things from. Because you'll notice that if you go to the YAML file while things are running, it's empty. There's nothing in the pod directory. It's only after it finishes that it, the last step, it copies everything over. It's actually, if you look at the YAML file, it's in there. It shows you that it, after it does the pipe, it run, it copies things. Uh, yeah. 
it's very confusing, the whole thing, the whole architecture of the cloud. It's pretty yeah. good, but the Y is still a bit above 0.1, but it's 0.12, so what do you think? I would say 10 moves only, yeah. Okay. I would say this. This thing really looks good. What is Y axis again? X axis and Y axis? Like so, what are the values? Uh, just one moment or for in a moment. Sure, yeah. sure. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Good, and then, yeah, okay, you've got your, thank you. Yes. Yeah, it looks good. We're gonna do an hour on this one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So in the, so remember there are these images of a square with a star somewhere inside that square. So, in the first plot, the X plot, what it does is it collapses all of the Y information. That means it adds all the rows together. Yeah. And it plots intensity as a function of X coordinate. So if the star is centered in X, that peak should be in the middle of that graph. Yeah, so here's the X. So it's basically saying if you drew like a, a line straight across here, and you said, how bright is it at each point on that line? That's what that chart was saying for the X. That's why I had like that kind of peak in the middle and then it dipped off at the side. Because as you approach from the side, it's not very bright and then it gets brighter, brighter, it's brightest in the middle and then it drops off as well. And then the Y is the same thing, you just cut a vertical line through the circle. And I don't remember if it does a cut or if it collapses all of the uh -huh. information in the box. I think it, I, I seem to remember it collapses. Carlos, do you? That makes more sense, probably. For the, um, Carlos, for final line, what is the algorithm? Um, it collapses in, in X and in Y. Because that makes so sense. It's like it's it's center of mass. If it was just a cut, it might not intersect. Exactly, exactly. That's the downside. I mean, it, uh, upside is high signal to noise, but greater chances of contamination by a companion. In fact, in this one, it actually found the star, the correct star in number three. I bet if you don't, if you remove the, if you add back the bad star, it's not gonna change anything here, but if you add back the bad star, I bet it won't change the thing very much. No, I because think it's 0.01 that are an X. Yeah, because it found the star. Yeah, the, uh, the last time it found the other peak. Last right? time it found the other peak. That's why it was important to remove that time. But... So it's still doing the... <laughs> Going across. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> next iteration. Oh, close. We could share this screen and explain what it's doing. Yeah, control zero, Carlos, please. We were going to show FCS. And although it is well past our time, so let's we should. Uh, oh, that's true, actually. Let's, we okay. should do, let's do this and then we'll call, okay. it, call it a day. Okay, control zero is what you want. Thank mm -hmm. you. Oh, yeah. Well, you, I mean, you'll probably build this it better than I will. But... <laughs> control zero. Uh, where are you? Oh, let's see. Oh, here you are. Uh, here you are. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Carlos. Well, yeah, so we just okay. sent the command to start the next exposure. And actually, I guess it just started. But every time you kind of make a change, um, you need to make sure that the telescope, that the instrument is aligned, um, which I would say is probably the cl closest way to say that. So this chart here is essentially saying, the, the physical instrument, DMOS, this spectrograph we're using is a very massive piece of equipment and it kind of can slump essentially under its own weight. And so we can tweak various things um, inside of the instrument to kind of compensate for that. And so that's what this thing, uh, FCS means the flexure compensation system. So we have to make sure every time we move it to a new target um, that we kind of re kind of adjust for that. And so we basically want this green square to be inside of this magenta square and the red points indicate kind of like every time it made it, it makes an adjustment and then it kind of sees where it is and it makes another adjustment so you're kind of we had to wait essentially 
you could see it started out over here and then it made an adjustment, which was an overcompensation and it went here and then it kind of came back to middle and then finally kind of came back right to the, the origin, which is where we want it to be. And then after it finished that, then it started the exposures. So you can see down on the bottom left here, you see progress. And then it says 90, 92, 93. That's how many seconds it's been exposing um, the image. And then this is just a progress bar. So it's basically we're 8% through this 20 minute exposure um, that we're taking right now. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. You explained it so beautifully. Oh, I'm thanks. impressed. <laughs> I've been learning a lot. This is actually this observing program is my first time using this telescope. So I've had to really be learning a lot of stuff on the fly. And it's been great. Um, Raja and Lara are both really experienced uh, working with ground based telescopes because I've often done a lot of work with space telescopes where you don't actually get your hands on things in quite in the same way. So it's really cool. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> Send you Anamita's right target at the Starlet Central. Great. Which is nicely graduated. For tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. And it's dropped right after um, I'm going to stop the recording of tonight's session. And but um, um, and uh, Annalisa will try to get a spectrum again, uh, 6 15 in the morning, your time. Uh, tell us if it's a lifesaver that you. Able to go in there and share your screen. That would be very, very. Yeah.